guys, welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you for joining me. I'm not gonna lie, today's case is horrific. I was gonna say that before I even start talking about anything else. You guys recommended it, so it's on you for the fact that I've had to go through this. You know I research very heavily. And now I am slightly traumatized and I've worked in high level trauma, so thank you. Just gonna say, if you do like true crime and you like consistency, I always say it because I do release consistently on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Also, I've got a pretty big back catalogue now, so if you like this video, go and watch the rest of them. Love a like, love a comment, but also get those notifications on so you get a little prompt when I release new content. And I have a Patreon, but like I always say, thank you to everyone who absolutely supports me on that. But if you can't carry on supporting me, just don't. And if you do want to, well, thank you very much, but no pressure. I hate anybody being under any pressure to do anything. And it's the same for those of you who send me money during the videos. It's like, please don't feel any pressure. It's enough that you come. I literally love the fact that my YouTube family is growing and it feels like a family. And if you've never come to one of my lives on my premieres, I say lives. It's not like me just sat here going through a case. It's my premiere where I join you for chat. Please do because my YouTube subscribers are the kindest YouTube subscribers in the universe. Like the community, Kenny's crime cult is growing. Sorry, I say that it's not really a cult, but my trolls on Twitter call it a cult. So I've just decided to own it. So now like, it's a good thing. We won't be poisoning the Kool-Aid. No, we won't be doing any of that. We might be group hugging if we ever meet though. That could be a possibility. Thanks for all the recommendations. I'm going through them. I will be YouTubing till I'm 137 if I actually go through all these cases. So I am looking at kind of putting a few together and making them not quite as long so that I get to cover certain ones on different days. But as you know, I have this obsession with research and making sure that I really do justice because we're talking about people who've died a lot. So I want to make sure that the people who come across this do feel that I have thought about the victims and done justice to their families. It's really important to me. So I have never covered a Japanese case before, but that is what I'm going to do today. The case is on Junko Fruta and it's a horrible one. It really is. It's also known as the body in the concrete. The location of this crime happened in Adachi, that's in Tokyo, Japan. And I am going to apologise in advance to any of you who are living in such areas and know the correct pronunciations for the names I'm going to talk about throughout this. I have looked up the Japanese pronunciation of all of these. And I'm going to be honest, when I listened, none of them made any sense. I'm just going to go with what I believe are the correct pronunciations. So please, apologies in advance if you're like, what is she saying? This makes no sense. She has no... Listen, I found French difficult. It's all you need to know. I find English difficult at times. The defendants in this case are 18-year-old Hiroshi Miyano, 17-year-old Ho Ogoro, 16-year-old Shinji Minato, and 17-year-old Yashushi Wantanabe. How did I do? The victim in this case was Junko Furuta. And as I said, apologies if I've got any of those wrong. Junko was born on the 18th of January, 1971, and she was born to a really lovely family. She had a really happy family life in Misato, Japan. She had two brothers and she was the middle child, like I am the middle child in my family. But she was not rebellious, quite the contrary. She was a really, really good student. She attended the Ashio Minami High School and she was considered a really diligent student. Her family believed that she was gonna go on to do great things. She was a child that caused them no problems. She was very well liked in her school. She was quiet. And also she was saving up. She had a part-time job in a plastic molding factory, which she used to do after school. One of the things about Junko was that she was very, very attractive. She was noticed because of this. She was very popular at school. She was considered an excellent student and she even had a job lined up for her after she graduated. So she was one of those children who knew where she was going, towed the line, made sure that she was well behaved around everybody, was good to her family and had her future set out. And that says something about her organized mind. And when you think and consider young people like that, 
whilst any child losing their life, it's horrific. There is something that impacts on you around young people who you know are gonna make a positive impact on the world around them. It's not that anybody ever has less worth in this world. It's just that there's a poignancy about a child that knows where they're going and also has historically caused nobody any problems because they're the least expected to end up in situations like Junko. That's what I'm saying. That when you think about the behavior patterns, that psychology, we don't expect young people like this to end up in horrible scenarios, particularly scenarios related to gang crime. And in my opinion, this undoubtedly is shrouded in that particular arena, which makes it even more shocking that this completely innocent girl ends up in such a sinister, and actually, I'm gonna be honest with you, the most horrific crime I've ever looked at. So out of all of the cases I have studied, Junko meets the most horrific end. What she goes through, what she endures is beyond comprehension and is unlike anything I've ever come off across before. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, I'm saying it's unimaginable to me and I have never ever come across a case as brutal in my entire life and history. Junko herself, she didn't do drugs, she didn't drink. She was one of those individuals that just absolutely behaved appropriately for her age. Now, I need to make it clear that the story of Junko isn't as linear as one would hope. So there are conflicting ideas about how she ends up in the position she ends up. But I'm gonna go along with the fact that she caught the eye of Miyano at school. Basically, he went to the same school as her, he was apparently the school bully. Others say that she didn't meet him at school, but this does seem to be something that many have told the story of, that he did see her at school and he did find her very attractive. She was gorgeous, she really was. He was also a real wannabe Yakuza. Yakuza is a gang and he desperately wanted to be a gangster. And he and his three accomplices in this crime were Chimpira, which is a young, low-level Yakuza. There are different levels of this gang. So they were already involved in crime. They'd already been involved in theft, sexual assaults, petty theft, all of the things that are kind of leading them down this very negative path. Now the Yakuza are a Japanese crime syndicate. They date back all the way to the 17th century. They're known for their samurai-like rituals, elaborate body tattoos. They're also known for followers having to cut their own fingers off for breaches of the Yakuza code. It would be at that point, I'd be like, ah, I don't know what I'm into that. I thought I wanted to be part of it, but now you said I've got to cut off my finger. I'm thinking, maybe not for me. But obviously as a sign of allegiance, you would cut your finger off if you breached the code. That in itself says, probably not a good thing to do with your time, kids. Also make it clear that this particular gang is involved in worldwide criminal activity. This isn't just a Japanese thing, they are a huge gang. Now the story goes that Miyano asked Junko out and she rejected him. That for him was a massive disrespect. You are talking about a young man who believed that he was the be all and end all. He was already the school bully. He believed that he belonged to this group of individuals that gave him power. And he would have had a particular perspective about women. Primarily that women would do what he said. And when I talk a little bit more about this kind of character, this kind of individual, you'll understand why I'm saying this at this point, because there was something very dramatically wrong about his nature, really, from the get-go. There is something dramatically wrong about this man. And I suppose we can all imagine that if he has this massive opinion and ego, to be disrespected in his opinion by her saying no to his advances, that would have triggered something within him. That doesn't happen. He would have felt really angry. And rage is something that Miyano has so much of. So let's look at what happened when the offence begins, and this is elongated. So when I talk about the offence, I'm not just talking about one night. I'm talking about somewhere between the 25th of November, 1988, and the following January, 1989. This is a sustained, ongoing, and 
heinous attack. What we know about this time is that Miyano and Minato were planning to rape someone. So two of the defendants were out looking for somebody to rape. This is something that they'd done before and it's something that they wanted to continue to do. The gang had recently raped another local girl. They had let her live, so they'd set her free, but they had a history of sexual assault and rape. Now, as I said, some sources believe that Junko was somebody that Miano wanted. Simple as that. She'd rebuffed him at school. He wanted to take advantage of her because of that. And he was waiting for her and planning to get hold of her. But if we take the other story, it's just that she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So this is where either intertwines and it begins the connection with Junko and this group of boys. But whatever the reality of it is, it seems like this is the point that Junko's life is going to change where these men are concerned. So she's cycling home from a part-time job and Mignano and Minato spot her. They see her on a bike and what happens is Minato kicks her off the bike. He then runs away. At this point, Mignano pretends to be the great boy, the good Samaritan. He says he's seen the attack, he's seen what's happened, and it's not safe. Clearly, she's been assaulted, she's been pushed off a bike, and she needs to be safely escorted home. Junko is obviously shocked. She's just had a horrible situation unfold. She's kind of confused about what's happened, why she's been kicked off a bike. And then this knight in shining armor appears, and she accepts that offer. Now, if they had gone to school with each other, that solidifies it further because he would be familiar. And of course, if somebody's familiar, we feel safer with them. But even if he had just been a stranger, the fact that he'd witnessed this situation unfold and he was stepping in to protect her, that in itself would make her far more likely to agree his help. And then there's a third possibility, which is that she's intimidated. And maybe he looks like somebody who's in a gang and maybe she believes to herself, I can't say no to this individual because that might be seen as disrespectful, so she accepts. Either way, he starts walking with her. Now, en route, he drags her into an abandoned warehouse and it's there that he rapes her. He then takes her to a local hotel and he rapes her again. This is a really young girl, completely innocent, very naive. She's not only been dragged into a warehouse and brutally raped, and it was brutal, She's now had it sustained. She's gone to a hotel with him, obviously completely within his power. Think about that. Think about how submissive she'd be in that moment. The fact that she's taken to a hotel. She didn't cry for help. She wasn't screaming at the top of the voice. You know, she was completely compliant. So many people make that mistake. A victim often feels that if they're quiet, if they complicit, then they will in the end be freed. My rule is holler like hell, fight like hell. I mean that. There's one bit of advice I can give you in those situations. Hopefully none of you will ever come across a situation like that. Remember my advice. You kick, you scream, you bite, you fight, you make as much noise as possible because if you're compliant, that's when they have full control of you. And honestly, a compliant victim is very easy to manage, right? We want to be non-compliant. So then she's in a hotel getting raped and then he rings his friends. He rings his accomplices that have done these other crimes with him and brags about what he's done. And then he arranges it as going to bring her to them. Can you just take a minute to imagine what's going on in her head? The shock, the extremity. This is a schoolgirl a schoolgirl. She's now been horribly raped. She's overhearing what's happening and she's being taken to be raped by other young men. In the early hours, they take her to a park. They search her belongings too. And because she has in her bag her address, they get her home address off her and they say, if you don't do what we say, if you try to escape, the Yakuza are going to kill your family. That would be a very real threat. Junko would believe that if she 
didn't do exactly what they said, her whole family could be wiped out by the Yakuza. Imagine the power in that moment that they have over her. From there, knowing, and they absolutely knew, that they've got her within the power at that moment. They take her to the second floor of a house owned by Minato's parents. It's also their gang hangout. Now, I will acknowledge that Minato's parents are clearly afraid of the young people that are around them and their own child, no doubt, because they're all gang affiliated. But the fact that Minato's parents let the young people hang out there and undoubtedly are aware of some of the things that they get up to says something very wrong with their parenting skills. Like, you're bringing the gang home? You're just gonna bring the gang home? The ones who are kind of constantly raping people and thieving and stealing. Yeah, you just bring them back. We'll get them take away. I have no patience with parents like that, sorry. At that place, that's where the rapes really began to ramp up. They repeatedly gang raped her. When people talk about gang rape, I think very often they think about the pornification of society. So, you know, you go on pornographic sites and you can find gang bangs and women seemingly getting screwed in every single orifice and seeming to enjoy it. And there doesn't seem to be any problems physically. But what we know in reality is that gang rape kills people. So when you are brutally raped again and again and again, internal organs can be massively damaged and your body can literally give up. I promise you, there have been so many cases of murder caused by gang rape during the act or after the act. So she's already in a very dangerous situation because gang rape is incredibly problematic for the body. And also we know this is a young girl and she has never had an experience sexually and she's in a situation where everything that she knew has just been completely transformed. She's now at the mercy of groups of men and she's going through some of the most violent attacks that any of us could even bear to imagine. In parallel, Junko's parents know that their daughter is missing. She has never, ever stepped out of line. So on the 27th of November, they tell the police. Simple as that. They're saying, my daughter has gone missing. Something is seriously wrong because she doesn't go anywhere. Now, I know and you know that gangs are often intertwined with the local constabularies and police. Sorry, it's true. Absolutely true. That's why police immerse themselves in things like gang culture. That's why they have undercover police officers working because the more that you know about those things, the more that you can kind of infiltrate them and change them or at least have a knowledge of what's going on. But it also means that sometimes gangs have positive relationships with certain individuals and they find things out. So the gang learns pretty quickly that the police are looking for her. So what they do is they get Junko to call her parents. They actually get her to phone them and she has to say that she's run away and that she's staying with a friend. Cannot get my head around how terrifying that would be. Can you imagine being Junko, hearing your parents' voice, knowing how worried they are and having to lie to them when all you want to do is say, I'm in danger, help me. And again, there's that part of me that wanted her in that moment to just say, I have been taken, help me. Because she was already in mortal danger. But again, she thinks that if her parents find out that she's been kept by these people, their lives are at risk. So she makes that choice to be silent to tell her parents that everything's okay, that she's staying with a friend. And I have no doubt whatsoever that Junko's parents would have thought there was something untoward. But nonetheless, she says, please call the police off. She's compliant with their requests. And the sad thing is, if she hadn't have done that, the manhunt would have begun. So her unspeakable torture that we're gonna talk about would likely never have occurred. The next 44 days that Junko experiences are completely unimaginable for any of us. And it's really affected me finding out that this child, because she was a child, endured this. And also, I want you to be aware that during this torture that occurs, Minato's parents knows 
that Junko's in the house. They're fully aware, fully aware that there is this girl in their house that is becoming more and more abused. Initially, the way that they get away with this is one of the gang says that she was a girlfriend of one of the boys. But even after it becomes obvious that this isn't the case and that she's being held captive, they do absolutely nothing. I appreciate they were very fearful of the gang's Yakuza connections and they were also very worried about the son's violence towards them because he was incredibly violent when he didn't get his own way. I don't care. I don't care. As far as I am concerned, his parents had a duty morally and also logically to that girl. This was somebody else's daughter. She was a completely innocent victim in their home being tortured. How could you live in a house knowing that there was a child essentially being horribly abused and do nothing because you're scared for your own skin? Cowards, they're cowards. I have no sympathy, no empathy. I don't accept the fact that they felt afraid. I don't care. They could have changed all of this. Whilst Junko's in captivity, it's terrific what happens. First of all, they shave her pubic hair. That's incredibly demeaning. It's humiliating. It's also something about them wanting her to look younger. That in itself says to me that they had certain fantasies that they wanted to play out on her. And shaving the pubic hair was part of making her look more prepubescent than pubescent. And they then constantly rape and torture her. Most of the time that she's in captivity, she's naked. If you think about how to make somebody feel humiliated and vulnerable, that's it, isn't it? To not even allow them clothes, to make them feel animal-like. They even used to make her sleep outside at night on the balcony and it was freezing cold. It's surprising that she didn't catch hypothermia in the state that she was. They used to make her dance and sing. They used to make her masturbate in front of them. And then they would invite others to come round so that they could join in the abuse. She was basically a performing animal for them. Just try to imagine the mindset there. This really young girl, she'd not had any experience of relationships, let alone sex. Certainly not gang rape or any of the things that she was dealing with in this moment in time. And she's coping with that on a 24 seven basis. The fact that she's constantly being made to feel like she's just a piece of meat to be played with however they choose, have no power in that situation. She had literally no power, no voice. How could she possibly escape all the things that you're trying to manifest in your head in those scenarios or how the hell do I get out of here? And yet she would not have any opportunity to actually even contemplate escaping because they were constantly raping her. They were constantly inviting people around and she was always under the watch of other family members. The other thing that was very clear was these guys were very proud of what they were doing. They were boasting that they'd imprisoned this girl, that she was completely available for sex. And because of that, apparently, many, many of the Yakuza members came around and raped her. And to put this into context, it's believed that she was raped more than 500 times by over 30 men during a captivity. I've worked in sexual exploitation. If that's hard for you to get your head around, get your head around it. Because in sexual exploitation, that happens day in and day out. Girls, boys kept in horrible places with people coming in, raping them out, in raping them out, different people all the time. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around that, but it happens right under our noses, in our areas, every single day of the week, 24 seven. Unfortunately, there are a lot of very sick people out there who have a particular desire for tortuous situations like this. But Junko is now completely at the hands of this entire gang. It's also reported that one of the things that a lot of her rapists used to love doing was whilst they were raping her, they'd try degrading her. And one of the ways they did this was they urinated on her. Again, the psychological torture 
the letting her know that she's worth nothing, that she's something that she can be pissed on. That's what it's saying, isn't it? I can piss on you. That's how little you mean to me. What is going on in these men's heads? That pack mentality, that gang mentality. Because it's all very well to imagine that we have a group of psychopaths here, but it won't be the case. Every single one of those gang members won't be a psychopath. Every one of those gang members won't be somebody who's out to use and abuse everything and everyone in their path and power. It's not the way it works. These are followers as much as leaders. These are individuals choosing to follow a certain path because it means that they gain in other ways. So yeah, they may enjoy the fact that they're part of this big gang and group. That doesn't mean that their psychology is matched with the actions that's happening. Many of them will be doing this to fit in. And we see this constantly in gang behavior. It's why in the UK, we have kids in prison for stabbing other kids that they didn't know on estates that they'd never been to. They do it because it gives them a sense of belonging. It doesn't give them any excuse. They're still murderers. In this case, they're still rapists. But the point is, they're not all psychopaths. Some of these will psychologically be doing this and be struggling with the actions because they feel it's the only way to remain part of the gang. That's how dangerous gang and pack mentality is. It can take somebody who would ordinarily not act negatively towards other human beings and make them dangerous. When you think about Milgram, which is a psychologist who just after the Nuremberg trials had occurred, so think about this, the year that the Nuremberg trials occurred, i.e. the doctors, the nurses, the officers, who throughout the Nazi invasion, throughout the horrific genocide of the Jews, played their part under orders. It was found that it didn't matter. They made their choices. They were all guilty. They hung. They hung those doctors, those nurses, and those officers because it wasn't okay to say, I was acting under orders. Yeah, you might have been acting under orders, but you also removed vital organs from twins to see whether they would cope as the other twin didn't. That's what you did. You blinded people. You removed organs from adults to see how long they could live. Like, you don't get to do that under orders. That's not what doctors and nurses do. Officers, you don't get to burn Jews. You don't get to shoot Jews. You don't get to do any of those things under orders because there's always an opportunity to say no. That's what people should do. You should always say no when you know that something's wrong, even if that costs you, because that's the right thing to do. My belief system is the right way is rarely the easy way, but it's always the right way nonetheless. So Milgram, because of that, thought, okay, is it so that we can learn? Is it that human beings can get to a point where they say no? And he did something called the conformity test. And basically he got people sat in a room where they felt that they were shocking somebody in another room and giving them these electric shocks. And under orders, they would be told no more, more, more. And they would be watching this person in the other room, basically screaming and saying, no, please stop, God, it's hurting me. And every one of them just went ahead, even though they didn't want to, and they delivered what they believed would be a fatal blow. And they did it. So Milgram's test of authority and conformity played out even in the year when we should have known that you have choice, you have free will. But for whatever reason, when people are put in scenarios of order and gangs very much have that, they can act outside the realms of what they should. I may digress a little bit there, but I'm just bringing it in that not every single one of them would have felt comfortable doing what they were doing. One day alone, in fact, anecdotally, the reflections have said she was raped by 12 different men. What really, really annoys me though, beyond belief, is that over 100 people knew that she was captive and not one of them helped her. 100 people knew and not one of them helped her. And that's an interesting thing as well, because if I think about the Kitty Genovese case, when we think about bystander interaction and bystander intervention, the more people who know something, the less responsibility they take for it. So ironically, it tends to be you're gonna get more help if there's just one person that's aware than maybe if all those other people are aware, because you're always thinking, well, maybe that person will do something about it. 
So in this case, we're seeing two really clear psychological patterns playing out. And it's all going horribly wrong for Junko because these are playing out stereotypically. It's also worth saying they pretty much starved her. She was given milk occasionally, not very often either. Now, one of the boys who was actually invited round and saw Junko actually went home, told his brother, and his brother told his parents he was that distressed by it because he was one of those kids who, yes, was on the periphery and involvement of gangs, but still had a moral compass. And the fact that he not only goes home and tells his brother, who tells his parents, that breaks the code, doesn't it? I mean, that puts them at risk. But that willingness to say there is something wrong here, that's bravery personified, it really is. Now this boy's parents do the right thing. They call the police and they say, a girl is being held captive in Minato's house. The police go around. I just want you to think about this. What is your job as a police officer when you get told that there is a girl being held captive in someone's house? It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Is it? Is it? In my opinion, is it? Is it a bit straightforward? Hello, somebody's being held captive in a house. I have the address. Okay, we'll go around and check that out. Thank you, because it would be really good to free her. Not a problem, job's a good one, right? That would be what we'd expect. No, no. That doesn't happen. Because when they call there, Minato's parents are like, oh, a girl in our house? This is not possible. And the police are like, okay, see ya. Didn't even search, just left. So you'll all be glad if you've got some mass crack house going on or you're running a massive brothel, or some kind of international money laundering situation in your homes, and somebody comes around because somebody's dobbed you in, just need to answer the door and be like, not happening here at all. And they'll be like, not a problem, sorry to bother you. But that's actually how it played out. I don't think it'd be wrong for any of us here to assume that the reason that police just were like, oh, no problem, is because they probably knew that there was some gang affiliation and they didn't want to get involved. Remember, there was a hell of a lot of corruption, even in security services. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but corruption has been very much the name of 2020 to 2021 on a global scale, in my opinion. But who am I? What do I know? The torture that Junko went through was horrific. And I'm going to go through it because I can't paint this picture to you unless I tell you what happened. I can't, I can't do justice to Junko. I can't talk honestly and openly about the sentences they received unless I tell you what she went through. And it's hard, really hard to listen to. She was beaten, she was kicked, she was stomped on, she was force fed alcohol, she was forced to inhale paint thinner, she got beaten with bamboo sticks, iron rods, golf clubs, she had her hands and nails smashed with weights, she had her face repeatedly smashed on a concrete floor. She was made to eat live cockroaches. She was made to drink her own urine. She got burnt with cigarette lighters. She was constantly burnt with lit cigarettes. She had fireworks set off in her ears, in her mouth, in her anus, her vagina. It caused massive internal trauma, really severe burns. One of the things that they really used to get enjoyment from was putting foreign objects into her vagina and anus that included large bottles, a metal rod, a light bulb, and they forced it up so far that the light bulb basically exploded inside her. They lit matches inside her, they put cigarettes inside her, they inserted scissors, they even inserted roasting skewers inside the 16 year old child's body and she was a child. They even tied her hands to the ceiling they used her as a punching bag. And they used her as a punching bag to such a position that she had such incredible internal trauma that she was bleeding inside. Bleeding to such a degree that it was coming out of her mouth. There was one occasion where she tried to get help. 
she basically got hold of a telephone and she was caught trying to telephone the emergency services and when they found her the way that they dealt with it was they poured flammable liquid all over her arms and legs and they just set her on fire it's indescribable isn't it to go through that it's unimaginable where her eyelids were concerned they burnt them with cigarette lighters they tore off her left nipple with pliers they stabbed and burst her breast with sewing needles and when she was being attacked she would constantly lose consciousness but they didn't like that they wanted her awake so they used to have a bucket of water icy cold water and then they would bring her back to revive her and then they carry on torturing her her body at this point was severely crippled severely mutilated in fact even when she was trying still to have some kind of dignity it took her an hour to crawl downstairs to the toilet and on this occasion when she was trying to get to the toilet she just completely lost control of her urinary and bowel movements and that was because of the internal damage in fact from that moment onwards she couldn't control it because literally the damage that they'd done to her internally was so destructive that it had destroyed all control. She was also bleeding horribly from the vagina. You know, she'd had foreign objects inserted. There was multiple rapes. Her nose was filled with so much clotted blood that she couldn't actually breathe through it. She could only breathe through her mouth. And also, just to put this into context, she was so badly damaged inside that when she even tried to drink water, and by the way, when she did try to drink water, she'd get beaten for it. But because the damage was so extensive, it would just come up. Eardrums were burst. And actually when they looked at her remains, one of the things they found was that there was a reduction in her brain size. Now that happens due to extreme neglect and usually due to extreme dehydration. So she was just tortured in ways I have never even consciously imagined possible. Ultimately, she just couldn't move from the ground. She couldn't go anywhere. She just lay there. She couldn't get downstairs to the toilet. And when she urinated at times, they'd make her do it into a cup and then they'd make her drink it. At this point, she's confined to the second floor room. And I have to put this into context. At the end of this torture, she was fully unrecognisable. Every single feature was swollen to a point where she looked nothing like who she had been. At this point, her body is also starting to fail completely. So her internal organs are going, her body is rotting, basically. She smells of rotting flesh because she's got so many wounds and so many burns and so many sores that they've gone septic. They're all filled with pus. She's essentially decaying in front of her captors. And she is starting to smell, making it that the gang no longer want to have sex with her. At that point, they just leave her and then they go off and they abduct another woman, a 19-year-old. They gang rape her in December 1988. Now, even though the rapes have stopped at this point, they haven't got a use for her, have they? So this just means that the beatings get even worse. And they get so bad that Junko starts asking them to kill her. She just wants it to end, but they don't. They just enjoy dragging it out more and more and more. They just enjoy it. Junko's pain comes to an end on the 4th of January, 1989. And I think probably all of us can agree that even though we wish that she had been freed, by this point, the likelihood of her ever making any kind of recovery is negligible to nothing at all. I imagine that for Junko, death was welcome. What preceded the murder was the gang had lost a game of Mahjong. It's a Chinese game which is basically played with tiles. They go back to the hangout and all they do is they just take all the frustrations out on Junko. They subject her to the most final horrific assault. They beat her, they kick her, they place lit candles on her eyelids hot wax on her face. They repeatedly drop an iron exercise ball on her stomach that's already internally 
broken. They pour lighter fluid onto her legs, arms, face and stomach. And they set her alight. Apparently she tried to put the flames out initially, but in the end she's just completely unresponsive. It's unbelievable, isn't it, that she would have been in that much pain that in the end she just completely gave up. Now during that final assault, this is how brutal they were. They knew that she was decaying basically. She was rotting away from the inside and outside and because of that they, she had pus all over her. So they put plastic bags on their hands so they wouldn't get any pus from her infected wounds on their hands whilst they beat her. So much was a premeditation about what they were doing. Due to this final gruesome, horrific beating, she started to have convulsions and just walked away to leave her, just tied up on the floor. Understandably, she dies from shock and she dies also from the injury. I imagine she had septic shock as well. I imagine she had blood poisoning. Minato's brother actually finds her, then contacts the gang and says, look, I think she's dead. You need to get rid of the body. The gang then comes back, they wrap her in blankets, they cram her into a large travel bag, they then place it in an oil drum, they fill it with wet cement, which encases her, and then they dispose of it in a cement truck in Tokyo. So you have to ask yourself, would anybody have found her? Because that is one solid way of getting rid of a body, isn't it? Even though the police had had a tip off that there was somebody at the house and they just ignored it, now I'm imagining that a lot of you are as angry as I am at this point and I'm going to be completely honest with you, I'm not going to soothe any of you when I talk about the arrest and onwards. So please be aware that throughout this I've just been really pissed off, really pissed off. And it's unusual that I feel at this moment in time that I'm glad I live in the UK. Like, seriously, if you're watching this in 20 years, we've just been through the COVID crisis, and that means that for the past 18 months, life in the UK has gone insane. And the government have overreached on every single level, power-wise, per se. Don't care what side you're on, don't care what your beliefs are, it's true. You just want to go and have a look at the laws that have been passed. But do I believe that if I called the police today, they would come and help me? Absolutely. Do I believe that when my kid got moped jacked and he got assaulted by two criminals, that that got taken seriously? Damn straight. Did they get them? Yeah. Will there be a court date? Absolutely. Did he identify them at lineup? Oh yeah, he did. What I'm saying is, I trust that process, right? But what happened in Japan, what happened to this girl, it is not acceptable and it doesn't get any more acceptable. And I'm telling you that so that you're prepared. The arrests do come. In January 1989, Miyano and Agura are arrested for the rape of a 19 year old woman, the girl that had been taken in December whilst Junko was still captive. So they arrest them. So they have these two. Now during the searches of the homes, they also discover women's underwear. Now the discovery of this women's underwear makes the police really suspicious. A young mother and a child have been murdered and they actually suspected Miyano and Agura. So they start interrogating them. This is March 1989 when the interrogations begin. Miyano believes that one of the gang has told the police about Junko's murder. So he's in there getting interrogated thinking, I'm banged to rights here, somebody's grasped on me. So that's why he thinks the police are interrogating him. He's got no idea that they think he might be responsible for the murder of a woman and her child. So he basically just confesses. I mean, even I was shocked at that one. Just basically says, yeah, I know where Junko's body is and says where it is and unwittingly turns himself in. Now, the irony is the police were actually confused. They weren't even looking for Junko. She's at a mate's house, isn't she? Parents got a phone call. So they have not even got this on their radar. As far as they're concerned, this is completely shocking news. So of course, I'm not going to ignore Miano's confession. And indeed, they go with him. They find Junko's body encased in concrete. By the time they actually found her, she's been dead nearly a year. The only way that they were able to identify her were through fingerprints. And that was lucky because fingerprints, when burnt, often dissipate. So it was really surprising that they were able to identify at all. Miyano, Ogura, Minato and Wantanabe are all arrested at this point. Forensic investigation would find traces of DNA from other men as well. 
in the body, to the remnants of the body, ironically, preserved because of the concrete. Just take a minute to think about that. If they had taken that body and they had put it in that barrel and they had weighted it down in water, the chances of having any DNA at all would have been nigh to impossible. And I love it. I love it. When criminals think they're too clever. But because they've encased her in concrete, they've essentially created a scenario where there's no oxygen getting to the body, where there's no water getting to the body. So of course the fluids that were in the body, the DNA that belonged in that body, it's there. So that means there are further arrests. When it came to the trial, well, there are different rules in Japan. And I'll tell you this because I know of a case where a 10 year old child cut off the head of her friend and she just had to have her parents pay a fine because they didn't think that she was criminally responsible. I mean, okay. I'm not sure that's true. I'm pretty sure if your 10 year old kid cuts off the mate's head because apparently they were a bit jealous, you might want to do more than pay a fine. I don't know, cart off to local mental health unit for severe assessments. Keep in quite a while, keep away from any cutlery. Honestly, that happened. But because of their age, the identity of the defendants wasn't made public. That happens a lot in the UK as well. But like in the media in the UK, nothing is a secret, is it? Nothing's a secret. You think it's a secret and then it's published in the Daily Mail. And that's exactly what happens here. A magazine knows who they are, gets their identities and publishes them. And they said, as a magazine, they went ahead and did that in spite of the fact they were breaking the law, in spite of the fact that they could have been breach of their actual publication details, it was worth it. Because the way they treated that girl was so heinous no one deserved anonymity. None of the criminals involved deserved that. July 1990, they offered plea deals. Miyano, Ogura, Minato and Wantanabe, they plead guilty to committing bodily injury that resulted in death rather than murder. Why? Sorry, why? What's that? It's, what? Hello? Are we actually all on the same page at this moment in time? They're offered a freaking plea deal, a plea deal, a plea deal. That's what you're meant to offer people when you don't think that they're bound to rights. This girl had been kept hostage for 44 days and then died horrifically, then been put in concrete and disposed of. We are not talking about a mistake here. We're not talking about, oh God, we accidentally killed her. And then we didn't know what to do. This is a consistent attack, brutality beyond belief. This is murder in the first degree on all levels. But no, they're offered that plea deal. Because they're all still juveniles by Japanese standards, that means, guess what, guys? You're going to be thrilled. They went to prison for 150 years. No, they didn't. They were given really light sentences. Miano got 17 years. The only bit that kind of amuses me about this is because he was so friggin' arrogant, he thought, you know what, I'm gonna appeal my sentence. So he did and he got 20 years. So they upped it. That's the only bit of justice Junko got. He was released in 2009. And then, mm, unsurprisingly, he got arrested for fraud a few years later. So in 2013, he goes back into prison, but is released the same year. Apparently he's now known for his high-end lifestyle and ties to organised crime. So it seems like crime doesn't pay kids unless it does. Now we all agree that Miano's sentence is shit. 20 years is pathetic for the brutality that he dealt that poor girl. His parents did, however, have to sell their home because they needed to pay $400,000, the equivalent of, to Junko's parents. Guess what? They did sell a house and they didn't give him a penny. No, they thought, you know what, we could give the victim's family the money, which is what they absolutely deserve after ruining their life. But what we think we'll do is we'll just keep it as a little nest egg for when those horrible gang members get out of prison, because you know they're gonna need to start in life.
Anyway, moving on. To add insult to injury, remember what we talked about with Minato's parents earlier. You know, the ones who knew fully that there was a child in their home being raped and tortured, even to the point where she was decaying. Didn't even get a fine. Not even a wrap on their wrists. No, nothing. No charges brought at all. On what planet is that acceptable? On what planet? They lied to the police when she was in the house, made out that they were shocked that there was nothing going on. They knew she was gonna get harmed. They knew that she was getting sick and they let her die on their property and they walked away completely free. Didn't even get a fine. And you know what's even worse? Later on, they blamed Junko because their son got sent to prison. How to create a narcissist. Just don't give them any responsibility. Tell them it's the victim's fault. That's what you do if you want to create a narcissist. They are obviously a deeply disturbed family who probably should not be on this earth. That is my professional opinion. It's not my professional opinion. It's my personal opinion, but nonetheless, reprehensible, right? That's what you do when you bring up a narcissist. You make damn sure that you just allow them to get away with behaviors that are completely reprehensible and you never make them take accountability and responsibility for it. And that's why they turn out to be bastards. Wantanabe, how long did he get? Well, originally three to four sentences, but again, we're going to appeal, aren't we? So we got five to seven. And Aguru, he served eight years in juvenile prison. He was released in 1999. Guess what? Even better. Because one of the things that I think is really important when we sentence people is that we acknowledge their remorse. It's an essential component and feature to the degree where actually there are individuals in UK prisons who've been given full life sentences and then they've looked at appealing sentences, but the person won't take responsibility and they're still in prison because of it, right? Probably on the whole because they're innocent, but nonetheless, there is an issue with showing remorse. We require it. So of course, a guru who gets eight years in juvenile prison is gonna show remorse, right? No, no, no remorse just boasts about it, is known to boast about the rape, murder and torture of Junko. And unsurprisingly, 2004, gets arrested again for kidnapping and assaulting a man for four hours. And what you're gonna love guys, because as a parent, I think that it's really essential to help my children come to terms with their own level of accountability in life. And that's important because as a mother, I'm teaching them. So understandably, a guru's mother is gonna have very strong feelings about the fact that her son has carried out this reprehensible crime, has been to prison, has come out and shown no remorse. And she demonstrates this by vandalizing Junko's grave. Because apparently she'd ruined her son's life. Of all the cases I've ever done, this is the case where I'm like, how is it possible for these kids to meet and equally have the shittest parents one could ever imagine? So they all basically blame Junko, who clearly wanted to end up weighted down in a concrete block after 44 days of intense torture. It was all Junko's fault. She was like, please hit me with the iron bar. That was the way she, please don't feed me. Please damage my internal organs. Imagine being parents who were angry with that child. What's even worse is when he got released, he basically frittered away his father's savings and that money was the money that was meant for Junko's family. I absolutely know that every single one of you at home now is going to be open mouth because you're right those sentences were absolutely ridiculous like you think about some of the juveniles that we talk about on this channel in america and the way that they're tried some of those kids they get whole life tariffs they never get out if this was in the states it's likely that they would have never seen the light of day 
I'm not sure if they wouldn't have tried changing the law so they could put them to death. That's how serious it was. But no. Where's the lesson to anybody in that? Where's the lesson to any gang member? Because to me, that gives light and license to people feeling that it's acceptable to do what they did to Junko. Now, some believe that those sentences were because the accuser may have been involved with it. So basically there was bribery, corruption. Obviously they've been involved in raping and harming Junko. So there is a potential that they stepped in. And that again would mean that all of those perpetrators felt that they had an entitlement to do it. Because if you have a protective mechanism over you, then why do you feel that you've done something wrong? And also prison wouldn't have been bad because you can bet your bottom dollar if you go to prison and you're being looked after by the Yakuza, you're going to be at the top of your tree, aren't you? You're not going to struggle. The guards will be scared of you. These are an international worldwide gang. These are not just a small locality group of people. They can make things happen that are very, very bad. So there wouldn't even have been a punishment inside. Every single one of those are living freely. Every one of those culprits is getting on with their lives. Junko was failed by the police. She was failed by the criminal justice system. She was failed by her wider society of those hundred people who all knew that she was being kept captive. That child did nothing wrong and ended up with an end that I think probably most of you listening to will not even have been able to imagine in your wildest of fears. It is shocking. And I have so much blame in this, so much blame. And much of it lies at the feet of those shit parents who went out of their way to deny Junko the justice that she deserved, to inherently believe that an innocent girl who was horribly murdered and mutilated and completely humiliated and eventually just dumped like rubbish, to blame her for their children going to prison? That has got to be the most screwed up mentality you can have. Absolutely ridiculous. That's like saying, my son, when he was drunk at the wheel and mowed down those three children, those stupid children, being on that pavement when he crashed into them and killed them, makes no sense, does it? But that's the kind of narcissistic inducing personality that we'd expect from parents who are unwilling to acknowledge that they have created monsters because that's what they're doing. It's a way of deflecting, isn't it? It's a way of saying to the people around you, it's not me, I didn't create a monster. That victim there, they created that monster. That victim there, it's them who's the problem. That victim blaming, it's quite common. I've seen a lot of abuse cases. Victim blaming is easier than changing your position and perspective over the reality of your environment. So you look at your child that you love and you're like, it can't be them because then it might be me. I can't love them and simultaneously see them as this horrific person. So instead I'm gonna see them as the problem and them as the person who's the victim. And that's what people do. And that's how we essentially violate moralistic behavior as members of families, as we saw in this case, because our belief is that we choose our child over everything and anyone else. And it's horrifying that Junko didn't even get the recognition at the end of her life to the point where her grave was destroyed by one of the boy's parents because she was angry with her. It's like, uh, I would very much like to be able to get all of those parents in a room just for half an hour to have a little conversation about what I think should have occurred to their children and also maybe to them for their perspectives over this situation. I'd also like a little chat with the police officers who thought that just popping by to a potential hostage situation then just being like, oh, no problem, I'll go, looks fine here. Because they are also part of this massive problem. They did get sacked. I will be honest, they got sacked. Thank God for that. Nothing I say or do today is going to make this more palatable. There is nothing that I could say about this particular girl aside from the fact that she was completely in the wrong place at the wrong time. They have made this into a film and they very much go down the line at the beginning, as I was saying, that there was some kind of romantic desire for her by one of the boys and that she rebuffed his advances and that's what caused it. 
But like I said, we haven't direct evidence for that. That might be more the Hollywood style of it. But reality wise, she may well just have been wrong place, wrong time. It's also worth noting that when she was buried, the place where she was going to start work, they had her work outfit ready for her. And so they handed it to the family and the family buried her, what was left of her in that outfit. So she did get to wear her first day at work's clothing. And even though that's just, oh, heartbreaking, isn't it? Heartbreaking to imagine. At least she got that. You know, her parents were incredibly proud of her. And that's the difference between a good parent and a bad parent, isn't it? They were proud of her for all the right reasons. And they knew that that girl would have grown into a good woman, a good mother, a good person in our society, a good human per se. And they'll know that. And one day, when their lives are over and they take their last breath, they'll be going to a really nice place in the big beautiful beyond where I'm sure Junko will be meeting them. And hopefully simultaneously, the families of the boys who did jack all about it will be taking a nice trip down, 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 down. And we'll come into contact with something similar to furnaces, shall we say, lighter fluid and a lot of flames. Well, I'll finish on that note. I think we all know where I am in this space and how I feel. Let me know how you feel. I don't think any of you are going to feel very much differently. I think some of you are going to feel a little bit more strongly about this case even than I do. I really appreciate your comments. As I said, we put a trigger warning at the beginning of this one today because it blew my mind and it continues to blow my mind. I hope we can all take a moment tonight to just think about Junko. To just take a second to send our thoughts to that girl who, with respect, survived the unsurvivable for far longer than I think most of us ever could. That says something about that resilient nature that lay within her. She was a warrior, albeit a warrior who fell. And I genuinely will take the thought of her and her capacity to survive the absolute brutality for such a long period of time with me because it shows a strength I don't think I would have. Genuinely, don't believe I'd have it. As I said at the beginning of this, I do have a Patreon channel. So if you want to support me making content, the link's below. Don't feel any pressure. And also, if you've watched this and you like it and you haven't subscribed, why? <laughs> Subscribe immediately. <laughs> I can see you. I can't see you. I can't. Some of you probably can't. No, it's just my paranoia. See you again next time, guys. Take care. No!